Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're very pleased to welcome you to our final webinar for this season of Nature's Returns, Investing in Ecosystem Services, a webinar speaker series hosted by the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. Through this webinar series, we address the growing importance of ecosystem valuation and investment. Each presentation is recorded and available on YouTube and Yale iTunes University afterwards. And you can find the links for these on our website. Our names are Olivia Sanchez and Logan Ashcraft, and we will be your hosts for today's webinar on Protecting Marine Reserves, Public-Private Partnerships in Cuba's Gardens of the Queen. Today, we're thrilled to welcome two of the world's most knowledgeable professionals on marine conservation in Cuba, Filippo Invernizzi, co-founder of the Avalon Cuban Fishing Centers, and Dan Whittle, Senior Director of the Cuba Program at the Environmental Defense Fund. Thank you, Olivia. And now, a little bit more information about our speakers. Filippo Invernizzi is the co-founder and co-owner of Avalon Outdoor, a specialized tourism enterprise founded in 1992 and located in Cuba. Originally from Italy, Filippo has dedicated most of his life to managing and promoting sustainable ecotourism. In Cuba, he was among the first to make the business case for conservation with the marine protected area of Gardens of the Queen. Dan Whittle is the Senior Director for the Environmental Defense Fund Cuba program. He directs EDF's work to advance conservation of marine and coastal ecosystems in Cuba and works with Cuban scientists, lawyers, and resource managers to identify and implement collective strategies for fisheries management, coral reef conservation, and sustainable coastal development in Cuba and throughout the region. So before we begin the presentation, we would like to remind our listeners that questions are welcomed and are really encouraged and that we will be directing them to our speakers at the conclusion of the talk. So you can type questions directly into the GoToWebinar chat window, which we will find on the right um, with the GoToWebinar panel. And with that, we welcome Dan and Filippo to Nature's Returns. Dan will provide the context for conservation finance in Cuba, and Filippo will then delve deeper into the Jardines de la Reina, or Gardens of the Queen, model. Um, Dan, the floor is yours. Uh, terrific. Thank you, Olivia and Logan, for inviting me. It's great to be here. It's great also to share the stage with Filippo, uh, who I've known for many years and runs just an outstanding operation in the Gardens of the Queen. Um, so I ordinarily take a show of hands whenever I, I speak about Cuba to see who's been uh, to Cuba, who's particularly been in the outdoors of Cuba. Uh, since we can't do that for the webinar, those of you who have been there will be familiar with part of what we're talking about. And those who have not yet been there, I encourage you to drop everything you're doing and uh, start making plans. It's really a phenomenal place, as I think you'll see over the course of the next hour. So let me uh, just get my uh, thing going here. Okay, so I, I'd like to give you the sort of broad context of uh, marine conservation in Cuba with a sort of special uh, focus on not only the private partnerships that uh, that Filippo will talk about, but sort of the broader uh, legal policy and uh, collaborative context. Uh, so essentially, I'd like to, to talk about why Cuba in the first place. Why is EDF working in Cuba? I want to focus in on uh, Cuba's efforts to protect its marine and coastal ecosystems. Uh, I'd also like to talk about recent developments in U.S. government Cuban government relations and how that has actually benefited uh, the work we're, we're focused on, and then just a handful of issues to consider as we as we move into the discussion on conservation finance. Uh, here is a photo or a, a slide of Cuba, just so everyone is familiar. Cuba is a large island, the largest in the Caribbean. It's about the size of Pennsylvania, uh, but as you can see, a much different shape. There are over 4,000 
small islands and keys all over the island. Um, extremely diverse uh, ecosystems, uh, mountains, you know, near tropical rainforest, you know, desert areas, a lot of agriculture. And as you can see uh, from the green on here, a fairly narrow marine platform on the north, somewhat wider marine platforms on the south. Uh, when we think about cooperation with Cuba, why we work in Cuba, there are two basic reasons that drive drive us there, that took us there. We started, uh, you know, working in the south uh, east U U.S. Uh, about to go to focus on overfishing and the protection of uh, fish habitats from North Carolina to Florida. And you know, after uh, not so many years, we discovered you can't really be successful working in the Southeast U.S. Uh, unless Cuba is doing its part to protect marine resources, uh, fishery resources, and other marine life. As you can see from the slide, uh, we're connected by currents. Uh, Key West is, you know, a mere, you know, 90 miles away from Cuban land, but a much shorter distance to Cuban waters. Uh, we work a lot on migratory shark populations, trying to restore them in the Gulf of Mexico. Cuba is a main, main uh, area for sharks. In fact, one fifth of all shark populations in the world have uh, been spotted in Cuban waters. Uh, after the BP oil. Uh, disaster in 2010, it became quickly clear that uh, we also share a number of problems uh, what to do if there's an oil spill. Uh, Cuba was extremely fortunate that the oil from BP did not actually reach its waters, but the impacts uh, from the spill may be felt in Cuban waters for years to come. Uh, we're also working in Cuba simply because Cuba is unique. Uh, it's known as the Pearl of the Antilles. Uh, the you know Caribbean's crown jewel. When Columbus landed there almost 500 years ago, uh, he or over 500 years ago, he said this is the most beautiful land human eyes have ever seen, and that's uh, something that almost every Cuban knows and is proud of. So these next few slides just show you uh, an array of of uh, just the wonderful marine and terrestrial wildlife uh, that they still have, including a high number of, uh, of endemic species plant and animals. Including the world's smallest bird, the bee hummingbird, and one of the uh, world's smallest uh, frogs. Uh, these photos are all from the Gardens of the Queen. Again, Filippo will talk more about that area. But it's just truly a wonderful, wonderful place, considered one of the greatest marine parks in the entire uh, Caribbean. We've been uh, working in Cuba since um, since 2000, just over 15 years. We work with Cuban scientists, Cuban lawyers, policymakers, decision makers, fishermen, community leaders, um, and it's just truly interesting and rewarding work. Uh, and in white are some of the areas we've worked on over the years, including uh, addressing offshore oil issues post-BP. Uh, in red are the areas that we focus on uh, in our oceans program in Cuba mostly. Our, our, our big focus is on sustainable fisheries management, which is a growing concern in Cuba as more and more uh, people take to boats and, and fish. Uh, we're seeing that virtually 60 percent of Cuban fish populations are overfished. Uh, as I mentioned before, we, we also have a big focus on sharks trying to rebound populations in Cuba that will have a spillover effect throughout the wider region. Uh, we're not the only ones working in Cuba. These are just a handful of other American NGOs and academic institutions with conservation projects in Cuba. And I'm happy to talk more about what all these various groups do. Presumably some uh, of these groups are represented on the, on the call today. Uh, let's shift now to, to Cuba itself. Uh, many people ask me, you know, is Cuba really committed to uh, conservation at all? Do they have a conservation ethic? Uh, is it just an accident that their, their natural environment happens to be in good shape because of the embargo and the lack of economic development? And uh, the short answer is that uh, the, the government is quite committed to, to environmental protection 
and uh, and, and natural resources conservation. Yeah, you know, starting in, in uh, 1992, Fidel Castro gave a fiery speech at the Rio Earth Summit, uh, making a commitment to sustainability, and then the Cuban government followed that up with uh, a new article to its constitution in 1992, a cabinet level. Uh, Ministry for the Environment called uh, CITMA, which is the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Environment. And uh, along with that, there are a number of other uh, cabinet level uh, agencies that uh, are focused on environmental protection. And then in 1995, Cuba adopted what's called uh, Law 81 of the Environment. It's a really impressive, uh, very broad umbrella uh, piece of legislation. And it spawned a num number of other environmental laws since then, including Decree Law 212, which is Cuba's uh, Coastal Zone Management Act, and Decree Law 201, which is its protected area law. And under that is something called SNAP, which is the uh, National System for Protected Areas, which I'll talk about here in just uh, next. So Cuba's decided uh, in the last 10 years to that one of the best conservation tools it has is is its national parks and and refuges and ecological reserves, et cetera. They have identified over 211 uh, protected areas throughout the island. Nearly half of those are marine protected areas, and the vast majority of those actually have some coastal component. You'll see around the world in the U.S. and elsewhere that that MPAs. Uh, are not necessarily connected to ecosystems on land, uh, at least the land-based parts of, of those MPAs are not protected. In Cuba, uh, the general rule is that there's a marine component and a coastal component. Uh, as you see from the numbers below, that uh, protected areas cover nearly a fifth of the entire archipelago, and uh, their target for marine protected areas is nearly a quarter, 25%. They've already uh, achieved about 15 to 16 percent coverage, uh, well on their way to the 25 uh, percent. This is a not a really terribly good map uh, of the protected area system, but you can see here that uh, there is coverage uh, on much of the coastal areas in the north and the south. If you look in the uh, the south central, you'll see that uh, that blue looks like a whale. That's the Gardens of the Queen National Park uh, that Filippo will talk about. But they follow the, the so-called IUCN categories for protected areas, so you have the very restrictive, uh, you know, almost wilderness-like areas in Cuba, and you have protected areas in which there are economic uses as well. They also follow a, uh, a five or six-year plan. Uh, for the system. There are a number of units within the system, and there are a number of agencies that manage the various units, not only the National Center for Protected Areas, but there's also an entity called uh, Flora y Fauna. It's a state-owned enterprise within the Ministry of Agriculture, and they administer the Gardens of the Queen and a number of other uh, protected areas. If you look at the, their current plan, you see a number of uh, areas uh, that they're focusing on. I, I, I went through here and, and put in yellow the ones I consider the, you know, the highest priorities. Uh, I should have just highlighted them all. But I want to mention just real quick that monitoring and enforcement is a really, really critical issue throughout Cuba uh, because of the lack of resources. It's just hard to monitor and enforce everything. Many of the parks are so-called paper parks. They don't need registration yet. So that's a major priority for, uh, for the future. Invasive species is a, on land and on sea is a, is a major preoccupation of the Cuban government. Lionfish have spread throughout Cuba, which is a major concern in some of the national parks we work. Uh, getting the public more involved in, in how uh, things are managed uh, is just taking off. It will become increasingly important as tourism, uh, or as someone has said, the tsunami of tourism uh, you know, arrives in Cuba. How do these park units, uh, some of some of whom have been, some of which have been very sleepy in the past, how do they accommodate, uh, you know, fresh waves of American and other tourists? Uh, sustainable finance is a major is issue in Cuba. Um, 
paper parks are there because they they simply don't have the resources to to uh, to support uh, personnel. And then climate change is universal in Cuba, a major major issue uh, throughout the island, manifesting itself in more intense storms and uh, sea level rise uh, uh, throughout uh, both coasts. December 17th, 2014, I was lucky enough to be in Cuba speaking at a session on U.S.-Cuba relations when, when the world changed. And since then, the Obama administration has been intent in leaving a legacy. As everyone, I'm sure, on the phone knows, uh, President Obama was there just over a month ago, and uh, his administration's been working uh, around the clock, in my opinion, to, to leave its mark to ensure that these changes are irreversible. Uh, there have been two important agreements on the environment. The first was hatched immediately after the normalization was announced. NOAA stepped forward and said, we'd love to work with our Cuban counterparts on protecting MPAs. In October of last year, uh, on the left there uh, is, is a, a Enrique uh, Hernandez of Cuba announcing that Cuba and the U.S. would partner on, on protecting uh, sister sanctuaries. John Kerry on the right uh, just hours later uh, affirmed the same deal. Uh, and just about a month later, everyone convened in, in, in Cuba and the head of NOAA, seated at the table there, was there to sign the agreement. Uh, this uh, agreement basically uh, combines uh, Two national park units in, in the U.S., Dry Tortugas and Biscayne, uh, and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuaries and Flower Garden Banks in Texas with uh, units in uh, two units on the northwest coast of Cuba. And I'm not going to read all of these, but basically uh, the agreement is to join forces on science, uh, management, and, uh, and uh, getting the public involved. Uh, this is a very, very, very um, interesting and important agreement. And in fact, it was the first formal agreement signed between the two countries since normalization was announced in December of 14. The second was signed just a week later, and this uh, agreement was much broader. It was in the works for over you know, five years. Um, and basically, it's intended to acknowledge that uh, we share the environment, we share ecosystems, and the two governments have to begin working together. Uh, on just about everything from climate change to oil spills to fisheries, uh, you know, to joint science, etc. And uh, importantly, in that uh, that second agreement, there's acknowledgement by both uh, governments to basically facilitate collaboration by non-governmental groups, including NGOs like Environmental Defense Fund, academic institutions like Cornell, and even the private sector. Uh, you know, that is just beginning to, uh, the U.S. private sector, that's just beginning to be allowed to, to you know, in, essentially invest in Cuba. So uh, just to close here, there are a number of issues moving forward, um, a number of constraints really on, on, on supporting conservation in Cuba. Funding is a major issue. It's still difficult for U.S. groups to, to provide funding to Cuban counterparts, Cuban government, or private in interest in Cuba. That's changing. There are a number of discussions going on now on how to open that up. The World Bank and other lending institutions still don't uh, work in Cuba, although they do receive funding from the UN uh, Environmental Program and Development Program and various others. There's a great potential to, to expand the amount of in in international support available to Cuba. Transfer of technology, uh, transfer of uh, science and knowledge are uh, really, truly just beginning. Um, uh, we talk about ecosystem services. Uh, again, Gleevo will talk more about that in the Gardens of the Queen, but there are a number of efforts to, va uh, to evaluate ecosystem services, uh, but there are not uh, many efforts yet to develop markets for those services. Uh, and many of those could be around tourism, uh, for example. Uh, there are two million recreational boats in Florida, many of whom are just dying to come go fishing off the coast of Cuba. So how do we turn you know, recreational fishing in Cuba into, uh, as opposed to a net impact? Those are some of the questions that we and other groups uh, in, in Cuba and the U.S. are looking at. And with that, 
let me stop and turn it over to Filippo. Thank you, Dan. For those of you just joining us, welcome to today's webinar of Nature's Returns. It's the final one in our season this year, and we're very excited to have Dan Whittle and Filippo Invernizzi joining us. So Dan Whittle from the EDF Cuba program just talked about the challenges and opportunities for marine conservation in Cuba, including access to sustainable finance. And now Filippo will speak about Gardens of the Queen and Avalon's unique business model, the investment structure and the role of private public partnerships for financing and managing the conservation of, um, of these pristine ecosystems. So Filippo, the floor is yours. Filippo? Hello. Hi. Here I am. <laughs> okay, we can hear you now. Hi. Okay, perfect. Um, let me try to put in full screen. Uh, anyway, I'll try later. Thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you for Dan for the great presentation. And uh, I do really get the, the idea of what the American point of view and the importance right now is uh, in in your country, but actually, and that's how I would like to start. In 1992, my partner Giuseppe and myself, we started in Cuba. In invited a long story, but fun. Invited directly by the Cuban government to start this specialized tourism, especially in fly fishing and fishing opportunities. So that was a long time ago, almost 24 years ago, when we saw for the first time a country that was far away from Europe, very close to the US, but at the same time was the, the perfect possibility for a young man like I was that just finished my studies in sustainable economics to have the possibility to start dreaming of something that was really untouched at that time. So in 1992 we started uh, bringing just a few groups, a couple of people and slowly starting uh, moving a lot more groups for fishing in a place called Gardens of the Queen, named after uh, the Queen Elizabeth, Isabel from Christopher Columbus, a, a nice story, but just to go directly to the this webinar is about, we realized right away that the Gardens of the Queen was something unique in the world. So thanks to the comments from all our friends, the tourists, and slowly the other people that we were meeting inside Cuba, uh, we realized that it was not only a beautiful archipelago uh, 60 miles south of the coast of Cuba, but was a unique ecosystem because of the location and because of the size. So look, Slowly, uh, over the years, the months, the days, uh, especially thanks to the help of my partner, Giuseppe, we find a way to communicate, like Dan was saying, the same thing happened with environmental defense, with the great uh, open mind of the Cuban side for protecting their natural resources. And exactly, and in particular, in 1995, with that same law, with that, that same important change for the future of the, the Cuban coast, uh, we were uh, asked and helped to realize what now is our sustainable uh, business model of managing the marine park we are working in. So it's uh, it's been almost 20 years that thanks to that law, we are now protecting and working for long term with the Cuban government in Jardines de la Reina as, as other five more uh, marine ecosystem. So that's how the story started uh, over the years. In um, Just to give you uh, an idea of the map, I know that Dan already showed you. Let me see if I can put everything. I know, it's in Italian. Um, Anyway, no, there's no way I can do it. 
Marine Marine Parks in Cuba, like the, the same map you, you saw before with Dan, are around 20-25% of the entire coastal area, which is a huge number compared to some nations and a small number compared to what might be the ideal solution. But thanks to this uh, slowly but concrete start, uh, the, some important results are already uh, be under the eyes of everybody. Because uh, uh, the sustainability of whatever now is common, and everybody knows what sustainability is about, uh, 20, 25 years ago was not that clear, uh, we try, and now in this moment I'm trying to explain you what we did to maintain and to be at the time we are now with a, such a beautiful place like Ardines de la Reina, or Zapata, or Cayo Largo, or Gardens of the King, or Cayo Cruz, all these marine park protected that we are reproducing our model. First of all, exactly how Ben explained, there is a huge question mark of what happened with all the, 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 the tsunami of tourists coming down to Cuba. And basically that's uh, what we specialize in since the beginning. Our business model that was uh, uh, developed and studied since the beginning, starting with the specialized tourists, was a sort of experimenting year after year and knowing the, uh, the Cuban side, knowing the clients and knowing the different markets. So because of this, over the years, especially between 92 and 98, 99, we realized that to be uh, a long-term investor, a long-term business planner in something that you believe not only for the economic side and the economic aspects, just to be uh, profitable, but also for uh, be part of a system that nowadays everybody knows is more and more globalized is very important to the third and follow these guidelines. So for this reason, even if we started everything as a fly fishing company, it was very soon left on the side or better said, it was integrated in, in different departments all together working for the same goal. In particular, we found over the years that, of course, that's typical in all the, all the world, uh, there is a high and a low season for fishing and for tourists. So to maintain the same goals over the year, over the, the, long, the short term, mid and long term uh, investment, we wanted to maintain, that's the key point, a very slow but concrete and fixed increase in growing over the years. So we don't, we didn't want to grow as far as uh, as much as we can uh, in short term, but over the years a very small percentage, but very constant. Thanks to this, uh, we determined that only with one department, only with one tourist activities was not possible, simply because. Every season, every uh, market, every nation has different uh, possibilities or they like to go in, in the Caribbean in some, time, in some months of the year and not in others. So it's the fishing. There is a reproduction season and not, so you need to protect or you can fish. So it's the same for other activities. So we determined that only with fly fishing it was not sustainable because like most of the other places in the world, you have a lot of people, a lot of pressure in a determinate time of the year and then boom, disappear. So is for example for the diving. You have more divers on a particular year, time of the year and disappear in the others and so on with other departments. So we try over the years to realize what sustainable planning for long-term slow growth would be uh, in Cuba and we found that fly fishing was the measure for the winter and the spring. Uh, diving was very good for autumn and part of the winter. Ecotourism, luxury trip and all kinds of other activities that are more general in tourism uh, was great for summer and that part of autumn that was not for the divers. But thanks to this, we were able to guarantee 
every single month full capacity in all our boats, in all our uh, lodges or places down in Cuba. So that was the base for our success, just separating the, um, the high season and low season, but integrated with different departments. And that was, uh, uh, let's say, from the marine parks uh, low and from all the, the changes that occur in Cuba after the 1995-96 till uh, the end of the 2000s. So now, a very small parenthesis just to determine that uh, most of the theory, the specialized theories around the world, doesn't matter if it's for sailing, fly fishing, uh, golfing, uh, skiing, whatever, is managed by between 80 and 90 percent by the US market all over the world. And dealing from 1992 till almost nowadays without that market was a little challenge. But thanks to the same concept of separation, the risk of separation, the markets, we were able to go through all the years and still maintain the little growth year after year. So. Uh, let's say from 95-96 to 2000, we were concentrating in the terminate in different markets this uh, key uh, uh, specialized tourist uh, uh, opportunities to maintain the occupancy still grow, but not uh, uh, grow too far, too far and too fast. Thanks to this, over the last 20 years, now we are represented in 58, let's say from this year, 59 with US, markets around the world. That's 58 markets that send specialized tourists down in Cuba. Doesn't matter if it's for ecotourism, it's for fly fishing, for diving or whatever. It's very important because thanks to this sustainable model, we are not searching for one unique market. We are not searching for just one activity, but sharing the risk, sharing the, the possibilities of keep the occupancy and keep the, the growing constantly uh, at the same level over the years, we're able to determine the quality of the marine parks, the quality of the tourists, and most of all, the lowest impact in the marine park. So that's uh, the, the key of what we did uh, till 2000, 2001. Then things changed and, and a lot of uh, uh, up and down in the world, everybody knows what, ha what happened between 2000 and 2008 and 10 with different markets and different crises all around the world. But Cuba, even if it was going up and down a little, was always stable and fixed and concentrated in, in the tourist aspect. That helped us a lot because we learned over the years and over the experience that that was uh, the key to ma manage our company in a sustainable way that was not only for the, the, the marketing, it was not only for the sale, but just to apply to be able to apply to all our single department also inside Cuba. And that was happened in uh, actually in the last years. We, we were honored, truly honored, to, to find people in the organization in Cuba, in the same that Dan named before, that were happy to cooperate with us, to working with us, to help us um, going through this change of business model in a, in, in, in a specialized tourism. First of all, because when you do whatever we are doing, if you do not have the base, the, the classic uh, first material, whatever is uh, uh, needed to survive in such as a complex and uh, very competitive market, which is the tourism, uh, you cannot go further than a couple of years. So the base was uh, maintain and protect the environment. The low 1995 and 1996 and all the different changes that occur in Cuba was a sort of a um, big help in a long-term uh, vision of what Cuba can be really now with a lot more money, possible money coming in to keep protecting it. And thanks to this, uh, and thanks to a lot of people over there, we were able to determine what really matters to keep protecting, to keep maintain, and find the funds to uh, to survive and go through over the years learning with experience. 
saying this uh, is, is important, for example, that uh, the word sustainable applied to this kind of, of business model is, is very general. But if we go through every single detail in every single uh, department we create over the years, we, we realize that after 20 and something years, now we are, for example, working with the second generation of guides, of instru instructors for divers, for uh, uh, biologists in, uh, in the ecosystem, in the eco-tour, tours. So it's, it's something that really uh, is a proof that is working because when you have the father that transmit the, the experience and the care of something that was before the place where they were using the commercial fishery boats to just go there and find a way to survive, you, see, you, really, real, you really see that there is a change in, the, in their mentality. Something I really like to tell is that the first trip in 1992 I took in Gardens of the Queen, I was 18 years old, I was very young. The guy that I was fishing with was used to get, drink a can of beer, coke or whatever and throw it in the water. We were killing every single fish that we were fishing, every single one. Nowadays, the second generation not only is stopping the, the skiff or moving or clean the, the beaches or pick up everything that floats, but also is uh, in the mind, their mind is the sort of a change on the attitude and they want in first place to keep protecting this marine park system because they realize it's a future and a possibility for they, their kids too. So this is something that really put us in, in, in a way that we realized that what we did was good, not only for the economics, not only for the company, but also for the, the way we survive and we want to keep doing this in Cuba. Thanks to this. Uh, Thank you so sorry. much. For, hi, Filippo. It's Logan. Thank you so much for walking hi, us through Logan. those details. I was wondering, could you comment a little bit more on any collaboration between Avalon and the Cuban government in raising investments for conserving the Gardens of the Queen? Absolutely. Um, most of the time was very hard for not-profit companies as exactly Dan just said before, to find a way to invest uh, and to accessory or just give possibilities to join uh, efforts and money. But in Gardens of the Queen, for example, we were we were lucky to have uh, the Sigma having an office directly in in our place. So it was a sort of a, a mutual help. We were giving them the possibility to use our infrastructure to maintain the, the patrolling and the enforcement in the area thanks to our instructors, guides, and so on. So at the end, it was a cooperation between the private and the public, between the Cuban aspect, they, their goal was to maintain their marine park in, in the best way possible. In our goal, there was the possibility to maintain and limit the number of people just to, to keep, keep maintaining the area. So actually, we did uh, over years and years and years help the, the, the Sigma in other organization to uh, patrolling to maintain the the attention worldwide on the importance of protected area and so on. What has been the enough? most? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. What has been the most affected methods of raising money and investments to ensure continued protection in the gardens? Uh, that's that, that's uh, uh, I understand perfectly the question, but the Cuba is not a classic uh, American model, especially where you have to deal with some other difficulties on the finances. Everybody knows that there is no way that you can have a finance or you can have a, a, a loan or a raising money in something that is considered high risk is there, there are a lot of there were a lot of 
problems over the years, but thanks to the sustainable model and the separation of the risk, and most of all, with the with the low but constant growing, we were almost able to find between clients, between friends, the way to have some money, extra money, to keep investing in these kind of things. We were, just to give you an example, we were making with the investors or with our own money, um, helping the guides to make their course to obtain the license. And that's every year. is is done perfectly by the Cuban, but of course it took years to understand how and give them the possibility. And of course it's, it costs money, a lot of money. But the results, if you make something in a business model that is sustainable in long term, these money are coming back year after year in, uh, in, in another way. So what is important is that we never had access, for example, to huge investors because actually it was not possible to guarantee the investment. So we were, we were dealing with this uh, since the beginning. But we, we managed the way to survive and now here we are. Then, for example, explain you the most of the picture, and now I can start showing some of them. Uh, th these beautiful boats, for example, are part of uh, uh, external investors that believe in this business model, and they want to be part of this dream to protect and maintain and use these very low resources natural resources but with a lot of extra in lifestyle so we get some some money in people that trust us because we were not able to guarantee anything there is no bank that can guarantee you anything so slowly with the results that we keep maintaining the high occupancy and give a high return on investment we were able to to keep growing and feel and keep changing and provide a very high hand services of course, the result of the investment and the result of the beauty of the vacation pay by itself. If you are in one of the most amazing places in the world for diving, fishing, or ecotourism, and you are in a in a vessel like this, of course, it changes a lot the the, the entire the entire uh, sensation you have. We we were working with, for example, environmental defense uh, since 1998. 97, 98, with the groups, uh, with people that wanted to see what real and uh, a cooperation between private and public and uh, a beauty as Arvines de la Reina uh, protected area can be over the years, and that's how we start cooperating with them. And and it's working. It's working because we are not working only with, with environmental defense, and it's part of our. Um, department, our tourist department, is to keep finding cooperation between non-profit agencies and the, the possibility of making new projects for the Cuban marine parks. Great, wonderful, Filippo. We are nearing the end of our webinar, so before we take questions from the audience, we're just um, wondering if you have any closing thoughts regarding your 20 plus years of experience in terms of, of conserving and financing the protection of this area. And after you finish, we'll move on to addressing questions from the audience. Yeah, I just I would like to uh, to explain briefly how works the sustainable management in tourism in protected area is uh, basically is uh, I, I try to make an example that most of your audience can understand. Uh, Gardens of the Queen, Jardines de la Reina, is an archipelago that is uh, the same size of the Florida Keys, and uh, as Dan said before, there are thousands of boats or fishing skiffs that every day are going fishing in the Keys. And uh, beauty as it is now is not as beauty as it was 50 years ago. But our model to maintain a sustainability in the specialized tourists was to determine, thanks to the Cuban side, the number, the minimum number to deter, to um, control the footprint of a human presence in the marine park and uh, make it the lowest possible. 
for this reason, and that's what make a huge impact on the audience, the same size of the two archipelagos, Florida Keys and the Gardens of the Queen. In Gardens of the Queen, there was, by law, a limitation of 15 fishing skiffs only in the entire area, compared to thousands in the Keys. And not only this, but because of the different season, we were able to maintain the low number of 15 also in high season. That was making a huge impact on the fishing, and so is the diving with air number, so is the recreational uh, uh, yacht and whatever, was making a huge difference in protecting with a low impact over the marine park. So that, that's, that's what really make, made the difference of the 24 years we are there, limiting the number of people by law, unfortunately or fortunately, not by us, uh, but to maintain the, the lowest impact possible. So it's limited the number of those that can join, but it's guaranteed for a lot more years. Because everybody knows that, for example, fly fishing in the Florida Keys in 40 years ago is not or was not the same, unfortunately, as it is now. But I can tell you that 20 years ago, fly fishing in Ardenas de la Reina was worse than what it is right now. Okay, great. Hello? So, yeah. So, the um, one of the questions we have is actually linked to this. So, how much of Avalon's model depend on the exclusivity of the service? And as the number of economic, um, as the number of tourists increases and diversifies, how do you think this will impact the business? Um, we understand that there's a current legislation gap as the legislation around marine protected areas is bound to change. Um, there's a transition towards every marine protected area having a management plan with specific enforcement regulations. But the issue is that these new regulations might not be in place before the current ones are lifted and before more and more boats start coming from the U.S. So this is a question for both um, Dan and Filippo in terms of the legislative context. How do you think the dependence on exclusivity and this legislation gap, how do you think it will affect the, the Gardens of the Queen? Uh, basically, it's not only for Gardens of the Queen, it's, uh, it's for all the six marine parks that are involved in our business model. Um, the, the limitation of the, for example, the fishing skiffs or whatever, the mooring for a diver boat or whatever is the other, the other uh, uh, department is, uh, is very well regulated and it's actually is working good. Uh, what is really important? is that the limitation, for example, or the exclusivity has two faces of the same coin. From one side, yes, we do have the exclusivity of all these fishing licenses, but on the other side, we cannot grow. So yes, it's true, it's limited the number, we are the exclusive operator over there, but we cannot, for example, high demand like now, add the double in the skills, we cannot. So is is working good for the environment, is not necessarily working good for a company that is handling it, but thanks to the different diversification and thanks to the different high season, the different um, time or season, we can manage to go through. But for example, if we have uh, 2,000 fishing skiffs coming in the flats of Cuba for fly fishing and it's not inside marine park with regulation and exclusivity, they would probably find better fishing in, in, in the Florida Keys. But if they want to go inside the marine park where the exclusivity is in place, they, they cannot because it's, uh, it's limited. It's limited for us, so it's limited for all the others. And that's what made a huge difference to be there 20, 25 years ago and understand the importance of uh, limiting the number to give the possibility over the years to more people and recover whatever was uh, a little less than uh, the natural aspect or the, the, the ideal better situation for a marine park conservation. 
And the classic thing is uh, the shark population. Shark population, from the day one, they was uh, protected the area, grow in an exponential way. And of course, they are growing because there is a lot of food and there is a lot of other fishes behind the chain that they can they, they can use. So it's, it's a general deep is growth. And that would really matter. Filippo, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, one of the points that you raised was collaboration with the Cuban government. So I was wondering if you might be able to tell us roughly about what percentage of Avalon's revenue ends up being returned to the central government in the form of taxes and if this places any limitation on the finance architecture to preserve the gardens. Is huge, is huge the percentage, and that's why the system is working for us. Because economically talking, uh, when you plan to make a profit on each single client, uh, that's what we learn over the years. You have to consider uh, costs that are not directly involved. The marine park uh, exclusivity, the license for fishing, all the um, Whatever are the other costs involved, at the end of the year, sums a huge amount of million of dollars that are part of the cost of the operation. And, um, and th that's what really make a huge difference. If we were not able to determine different departments, different tourist activities, we were not able to cover all these costs. And uh, the classic example was uh, other areas that was managed in different ways. They, they didn't go through all these costs and the quality was going down. So once you determine your goals, once you determine how to cover this cost, then you can just make a long-term planning. In particular, in Gardens of the Queen, for example, uh, the, the simple fishing, fly fishing operation is not more than 30% of the general income. And the other 30, 35% is, uh, is diving. But not only these two are enough. So we added the, the eco tourist, the luxury trip, and all the other things to guarantee the 100% uh, funds to cover the high cost for, this, uh, for these activities. And of course, over the years, with more marine park, uh, with more activities, with more location around Cuba, the cost grow exponentially. But we repeat the same model, so actually it's working. And yes, it's very expensive. And a percentage in itself, I'm not, I cannot tell you right now, but is uh, almost 90% of the total is going down there, which is good. Is is not uh, is the exactly things that I started the presentation with. Determinate a slow but constant growing in profit or in the in the in the company. Thank you for sharing that with us, Filippo. Um, 90% is a very large chunk of your revenue. And so I was wondering, um, and Dan, maybe you can comment on this, if there is opportunities for organizations like the Environmental Defense Fund to help Avalon approach these risks and challenges with investment. I, I, before Dan start, I would just uh, 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 add something about this is uh, yes there are possibility but it's not the goal the goal for us is to maintain and make project that makes sense for the Cuban uh, government for the Cuban marine protection system to get better because only getting better help us indirectly to keep having clients the limited number of clients that can enjoy speak good about Cuba bring their Cuban dreams between their friends and they want to come back to Cuba. So yes, the costs are huge, but if we can transform or get better and bigger, for example, they, um, uh, the monitoring and enforcement, for example, that's a, a basic and classic important thing in every marine park at the beginning that depend on the Cubans and we find a way to improve it, that 
fantastic. It's an extra cost, but not the, not necessary part of the 90% depending on us, but the result will be amazing. So yes, there are a lot of possibility to invest and to make new project coming in reality now or in the future for the Cuban marine parks that can help or can be helped for the ecosystem and of course for those that are trying to maintain it in, in the first uh, as natural as they can. So, I, I can, Dan, I, yeah, let me just jump in uh, real quick. I'll try to cover several things real quickly. Uh, the opportunities for impact investing in Cuba are still extremely limited, although that will change over time. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of private sector entities, uh, non-governmental, etc., that want to support uh, private enterprise in Cuba. Um, either private cooperatives in Cuba or private businesses, and there are still serious limitations on the ability to do so. Um, but hopefully that will change where impact investing can occur. Um, in terms of the business model that uh, Filippo is describing, it's a good business model. Uh, it's a win-win uh, model that works for the company and works for the government. As he mentioned, Avalon puts a lot of uh, of, of money back into uh, the system in terms of infrastructure, uh, monitoring, enforcement. Uh, they're also, you know, one of the best jobs uh, going in these coastal communities. Uh, they're, they're, they've supported families uh, not only in the coastal communities but far and wide. So, uh, so it's a good business model. The exclusivity uh, obviously is important to them uh, in the places they work. It's like a concession in a national park in the U.S., there's absolutely a value to that, and by providing that exclusivity, the Cuban government can, you know, essentially demand more in return. Um, that will change. Um, you know, right now, uh, the, the, the concessions are essentially joint ventures or contracts between an international uh, company and the Cuban government. There uh, needs to be more opportunities for uh, the private sector of Cuba. Uh, you know, at the moment, if you're a, a Cuban individual, it's hard to get a license to to be a tour guide or to you know take people fishing or whatever. That will change, and so it all comes back to how well Cuba manages not only its national parks and marine parks, uh, which is going to be a huge part of it, but how does it manage resources outside of those parks? You know, I'm thinking fishing. You know, right now the Cuban government. Is, is aggressively trying to put new controls in place to curb uh, overfishing in the, in, the, in the Cuban commercial sector. Uh, but again, the sleeping giant uh, are all the boats from Florida and the Gulf who want to come down and fish for marlin, billfish, etc. There have to be rules in place to, to better manage that and also to create economic opportunities for you know, Cuban uh, uh, Cuban individuals, uh, including many displaced uh, commercial fishermen. So uh, we've covered a lot, but, in, uh, but I want to commend uh, Avalon, Filippo, and Pepe, you know, for making the kind of long-term uh, investment that they have made, and, and they've really made a, 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 a very strong impact on the protection of that area uh, because they're on the water, because they monitor, and because they support science. Some of the best science, marine science, in the country has been done in the park because of support from Avalon. They've supported, uh, you know, Cubans and Cuban scientists and just performing their work. So, uh, so let me just stop there, and I guess we have a few more minutes. Dan, thank you so much for those comments and for all of your help and guidance throughout planning this project. We are extremely grateful. Your comments this afternoon will conclude our webinar on protecting marine reserves, public-private partnerships, and Cuba's Gardens of the Queen. Once again, a final time, Dan Filippo, we cannot thank you enough. Um, it's extremely rare to get such two incredibly renowned professionals in this area, both having on-the-ground experience in Cuba in the same room at once. Thank you so much. If you wish Thank to you, do Dan. a recording of this webinar. Oh, sorry, Dan, for cutting you off. What were we saying? No, just thank you very much for uh, inviting us. <laughs> thank you, Logan. Thank you, Olivia. And thank you to the audience. And, of course, Dan.
for me is uh, 25 years that I'm, uh, I'm 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 working in this uh, not for this moment but I'm really enjoying this moment that I had the possibility to present uh, what I spend most of my working life on on realize a dream so thank you Confess. thank you Filippo for the audience if you if you want to view a recording of this webinar please visit the CVA website or you can also access it through YouTube or Yale iTunes University. Um, thank you for joining us today. Stay tuned for updates from Nature's Returns. The webinars will resume after summer. So until next time, this is Olivia Sanchez and Logan Ashcraft from the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. Have a wonderful day.